we're getting ready to get started. <clears throat> Audio and video check is good. Oh man, I'm really excited to get started. people to join us really quick before we really get started into the main part of our live stream today. We are sketching. I'm pretty excited. Um, over on the Facebook group. Um, yay! Perfect. Welcome, Amy. Um, over on the Facebook group, we had a little vote in the event to see kind of what orders we wanted to look at today. Um, we had three votes for bees, wasps, and ants, and two votes for beetles. So, I figured we, we could look at um, a couple of bees, wasps, and ants first, and maybe we would get to a blister beetle, which is really interesting because as immatures, they're parasitic on bees. So, they kind of work together, and um, I figured that would be good for us. Um, so welcome Amy and the rest of everybody, uh, feel free to keep the chat box open and, um, running. If you have any questions or comments, go ahead and throw them in there. Um, we're gonna start with the insect that's actually under the microscope right now. That's a sweat bee in the family Helicted. Um, you'll see on the screen there's this really fun little red dot that likes to zoom all over the place. That's my pointer dot. I, um do have full control over it, every, although it likes to bounce around next to me. Um, so you'll be seeing that kind of over the course of the stream as we're pointing things out and talking about, um, and talking about our insect's body. All right. Um, it does look like our specimen may have lost a couple of segments of the antenna, so when we are looking at that, we can kind of sketch in the fix. Now, um, you'll see that this is where I'm, my drawing is going to be, over here, and um, you can go, a lot, go ahead and sketch along with me, or you can take this class and turn it into whatever you'd like. I do have a boo-boo, but I put my ladybug sticker on it, so I was pretty excited. All right, yay. Okay, so we are working, this first insect that we're working with is a sweat bee. So um, the scientific name for this family is Helictidae, or sweat bees. And one of the first things that we notice about sweat bees is a lot of them have these really, really beautiful um, metallic colorations on their exoskeleton. So you can see this one right here is kind of that green and blue metallic colors. Um, those are structural colors rather than pigmented colors. So what I mean by that is the exoskeleton actually has little itty bitty crystals all over or like little shapes all over the outside of its exoskeleton that will reflect and give those colors off. Um, so over the course of time, sweat bees don't ever um, fade in color. Whereas things like dragonflies and grasshoppers and praying mantids, those all use pigmented colors. So over the course of time, they're going to fade. Welcome, Rosie. All right, so I always start off with the head up here, so we might as well go ahead and, and start off here. Um, I like to draw a first, I like to draw kind of this dorsal view of our bee, and then we can go in and kind of change it at different angles and see kind of how we want to draw it or what, what, what that wants to look like. Um... I, uh, I know I'm talking to the choir, I know I'm speaking to the choir, but when I'm sketching I like to make um, short light lines just in case I want to go ahead and erase things. So something that we're going to notice about our head of our helicted, they have these really big compound eyes, right? They have the um, many, many, many facets on these eyes. 
And bees can also see um Sorry, give me give me a minute. To focus on my my thing, the jig. Yeah, bees can see past colors that we can. I believe they can see into the ultraviolet um, shades. Now, so these are going to be our two really big compound eyes. But holictids also have simple eyes, um, and so when we're looking up at the head, the simple eye is going to be these little circles up here in the top. Get my B into focus. Oh, cool. All right. So right up here in the top, those three little, um, those three circles on its head, those are actually what we call ocelli. <laughs> Come on. There we go. All right. So these three up here in the top. Those are what we call ocelli. It's spelled O-C-E-L-L-I. And th that's our scientific name for the simple eyes. So whereas compound eyes, compound eyes can see compound things like um, shapes and colors. Uh, they can see the... Um, they can see the ultraviolet light off that, that's reflected off flowers, those types of things. Um, whereas the simple eyes only can really see um, the night versus the day, um, the sun versus the shade. So these eyes, they mostly can see, um, see like dark versus light rather than full shapes. All right. And then we're looking at those antenna. And those antenna are what we call elbowed antenna. So you can see that it has this first joint that's fairly long right about here and here, right? So that first segment is kind of long, but then all of the all of the next ones are shorter and smaller segments. And what this makes It makes antenna that look kind of like an elbow. Now, as you know, the um, insects' exoskeletons cannot bend, right? So anywhere that you see anywhere that you see an insect's body body bending, um, moving like legs, antenna, wings, those types of things have to have little itty bitty um, sutures or like little um, segments so that they have the ability to move around. Um, a lot of times, here. Sometimes I'll just sketch one side of the antenna because um, insects, as you know, are symmetrical, right? So they're going to look the same on both sides. But I can throw that in there. All right, so I've got my, I've got my head. And then we're moving back to the thorax. Now... Um, the thorax can be divided into three, um, into thirds, and then insects are going to have six legs, right? So the first pair of legs is on the first third, the second pair of legs on the second, and the third on the third, right? So our thorax, all right. Many thoraxes are, are like uh, kind of square shaped, and that's because of the way that the muscles kind of have to connect onto the body. This one, he's got lots of rounded edges, and um, that kind of blurry spot in the middle of his body that you see, um, that is actually the pin. A lot of times um, they tell you not to put the pin through the center of the insect. You want it kind of off to the right, just in case there's any characters on the center line. Um, looks like when I was pinning this guy, I got it pretty well in the center, huh? All right. So what I'm doing is I'm coming through and looking at these individual segments, right? There's a line that comes through here, a line that comes through here. You see, and they work their way down. And right about here and here, this is where I'm going to have, this is where I'm going to have my wing connections. 
because your first pair of wings is actually connected to the first segment of the thorax, and then the second pair to the second segment. So I am sketching right here the, bo the body parts on the, th the top of the thorax that I can see and kind of leaving space for these wings to come open up. Very good. All right, so we've got the head of our sweat bee down all the way to the thorax. We have the start of the wings. I want to go through, and we're going to go through and finish the entire body first. Um, and then we'll go back and add the legs. That's just going to make it a little more simple on us. Because I think, yeah, the legs in this specimen, I think we're going to actually have to flip the specimen over to, um, to, mat to see all of the segments. At least for the first pair of legs. All right, so let's get this mi microscope moving. Does it look like the thorax has a fourth segment? Well, um, there are there are many. Um, let's see, there are many different segments or different kind of uh, plates on the thorax, right? So we've got this first one up here. There's this one right here. There's a thin one, and then right here. But what we're actually going to be looking at in a minute is the thorax also continues to, you see where this leg is? We're going to look. Um, but yeah, it almost looks like the thorax has a, has like a fourth segment. Um, if we turn this bee on its, when we turn this bee on its side, we'll be able to, um, to see that a little bit better. And hi, Akshay. All right, let's see. Actually, we can turn it on its side just so that we can look at that really quick. It's a gorgeous view of this bee. All right, so you can see that there's this little bit of a gap between the first pair of legs is kind of up here in the front, and then there's this gap between the first and the second pair. And then the second pair and the third pair are back here. And yes, the thorax does end right about here. Sometimes, every now and again, you'll have, um, You'll have an extra segment that's actually the thorax that looks like it's on the abdomen, but it doesn't look like this bee has that. So that's good. All right. So what I'm trying to say is yes, it's broken up into a variety of it's broken up into a variety of plates, um, and then the legs are going to be connecting the front and then back here. And we talked a little bit about this um, last week where we know that the first pair of legs on insects a lot of times faces forward, whereas the second and the third pair of legs go backward. Um, and that just helps with stability. Um, six is the magic number for insect legs uh, because they have the ability to walk on two tripods. And tripods are triangular, right? They're super, super strong structure. That's what gives um, insects the ability, uh, so much stability with six legs. It's because they always walk on two tripods. So I want to get our dorsal view done. I love the color on colors on this bee. All right, so there are two things that we are looking at with this specimen. We're looking at both the abdomen and the wings. Um, 
Now with my sketch, what I'm going to do is I am just going to sketch, with my sketch what I'm going to do is I'm going to sketch the left wing and then the right side of the abdomen. Um, that's going to give everybody the ability, uh, that's going to give the ability, everybody the ability to kind of see both sides of the insect. All right. So I'm going to start, let's see, it comes down, all right, and I'm starting with the abdomen. Now we've got this little, let's see, doop, 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 all right, finish off the thorax, give yourself an abdomen. And the abdomen looks like it does not protrude further than the shoulders. So if you're giving yourself, if you're giving yourself a line, you don't want to make your sweat be too, too bumbly, right? Bumblebees are very wide and large. Um, sweat bees don't tend to be as, as uh, wide. But he does come down to a pretty good point. And then I've got my wing. I'm just trying to imagine what this looks like. Don't mind me while I bump the camera a little bit. All right, so we've got we've got a wing and we've got an abdomen. Now, each one of these segments actually has this line of kind of hair or fur on the edges. So here and here. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to flip this specimen over really quick so we can count how many segments are on the abdomen so we know how many to give it. Sometimes it's just easier to count the segments from the bottom where the wings aren't in our way. Let's flatten that out a little bit. All right, so from what we can see from here, this would be the first one, so that's a one, a two, a three, a four, and then five. And as we can see, they do kind of fit into one another. So we are looking at giving our sweat bee, our helicted, five segments. And the first three look like they are fairly large and pronounced, whereas the next two are kind of shorter. So I'm going to go in right about here and here. One day I will incorporate colors and I will start doing, um, and I'll start bringing in colored pencils and things. So our first segment would actually be, end right about here. All right, and then this is where our next segment starts. And, I always like to give almost these little angles at each one of the um, at each one of the segments, just to kind of um, show that it's kind of tucking in one after another. And I'm using these um, lighter strokes to show the uh, to show kind of the hair, how fluffy they are. Sweat bees are pretty fluffy. 
Now, sweat bees do have the ability to sting. Um, and if you want to talk about the pain index, it's kind of fun. I think sweat bees have like a one or, or a one and a half. So sweat bees don't really hurt at all to get stung by. Yes, it does matter. So in scientific literature, if we are naming, if we are numbering the abdominal segments, you always go from the front of the insect all the way to the back. So this segment right here is a one, and then we call this a two, a three, a four, and a five. And so we always start from the thorax side. And if you wanted to do the thorax, if there are three very distinct segments, you can say T1, T2, and T3. Um, and this guy, there were so many plates up here that it would almost be kind of difficult to do that. Um, I'm sure that entomologists have named all of those plates. I'm just not sure what they are. Um, there's some really cool quote, and I'm not sure who it's by, but it's along the lines of, no one person can be considered an entomologist. The, the study is just so vast that not, no one person can know it all. Um, and that's something that I kind of love. It's also one really cool thing about entomology is there's always more to learn. <laughs> All right, so I am looking at this wing, and we're going to talk a little bit about wing venation. All right, um, so when we're talking about wing venation, this vein right here, that's the leading edge, this is the costa, and it's also the strongest vein. Um, this, it's going to be the strongest vein in the, in the whole wing because we can see right about here, it's very, very thick right and then we get to this area right here that's kind of this expanded area of the coxa that little spot right there that's what we call the stigma all right and then we have a number of uh, we have a number of cells in our wings um the first cell that you can see off of the um off of the stigma comes out in this direction. All right, and this is going to be the coastal cell, right? So this is the coastal vein. This is the coastal cell. It's the one on the edge. But then we have subcoastal cells, and collectids always have three. So if we are looking, I can even put my dot in them to show you. This cell right here is like this little rectangle. Um, this cell right here is a square, and this cell is kind of square on this side, but has the wiggly line on the other side. Those three cells, that's actually an identif- that is one of a couple identifying characteristics for helicted bees. All right, so all sweat bees are going to have those three subcoastal cells. So something like it comes up and it hits right about in there. One. So wing venations are really interesting because a lot of other characteristics with insects, um, colors and dot patterning and shapes. Um, what is the scale of the sweat bee? Good question. Let me get my my ruler was right here um, two moments ago. All right, so I am going to zoom out on my microscope and throw this ruler next to it. I assume, because we're doing science, we want it in centimeters.
So from about head to abdomen, it's almost exactly one centimeter. You might go 0.9, but yep, that's about our scale. I think that um, my microscope program does have the ability to put um, scales actually onto the screen. So maybe I'll play with that. Akshay, was it, is it smaller than you think it was? Than you thought it was? <laughs> it is! It's incredibly small and cute. And these guys, oh, I forgot to zoom back into our wing. I feel like collectids don't get enough credit for being amazing little native bees, right? Because we have honeybees that get all of the credit, but honeybees are actually not native. They're, um, they are originally from Europe, right? So the settlers actually brought honeybees over um, for their honey and for pollination. I'm seeing out there that it's a lot smaller than pipe people thought. So yeah, and and when we're looking at these guys when they're flying around, um, they can almost seem like well, that's a small little bee. You know, you could almost brush them off, and then you you stop and you look at them, and you're like, these guys, they're absolutely gorgeous. Um, if you have an interest in all types of insect wing venation, I'd like to suggest a website called drawwing.org. They have um, wing venations from all different types of insects. All right. Now, all of these veins do have names. I am not sure what all of the names of the veins are. Um, and they are a little bit more difficult to see with the wrinkles in the wings. So I'm just kind of throwing my estimate out there for these ones. Um, these ones are also not characteristic, at least to family level, um, in that um, the rest of these veins, they're not going to tell us more about our bee unless we are trying to, unless we're looking for... Um, uh, deeper characterization. Alrighty, so we have the bo our body. Um, we can go ahead and zoom in. We might as well do the legs from the back forward, I think. And the right side, the legs are all out there waiting for us. Do all bees have a stigma? No. No, um, not all bees have a stigma on their vein, on their wings. Um, <laughs> the stigma is not a characteristic feature. Um, it's common in a number, the stigma is a common in a number of um, different insects, even um, insects that are outside of bees and wasps will sometimes have a stigma on their coastal vein. So we try, it's funny because entomologists will um, sometimes have the same name for different parts of the body depending on what insect you're talking about, but with wings everything generally stays the same. And wings are like, um, they tend to be characteristic for families and so what's characteristic on my collected is one, two, three, subcoastal cells. Um, I would have to look at my cheat sheets for the other characters. I believe there's a character on the head. Um, I'd have to look them up. Um, alrighty, so insect legs, very similar to human legs. We talked a little bit about them last week. We have a femur, the first segment, the tibia, the second segment, and then the tarsals, 
or the tarsi, and these are the segments at the very, very end of our legs. And then at the very, very, very end, we have two what we call tarsal claws. Um, so we're going to be able to look at those friends and you'll notice that a lot of bees and wasps will have will be very cetos or be very very hairy and um, that all of that hair definitely helps with pollination helps with collecting all of the little um, all the little pieces all right so that's where my wing comes out we're just going to imagine this is also i'm going to put the wing on one side and i'm putting the legs on the other side um it gives my sketch it can kind of show you all of the pieces um so i'm going in for this femur and we're looking at where it connects the very very end of the thorax um and then this tibia almost looks like it has, uh, this tibia almost looks like it has this curve in it, which is really interesting. You won't really see that super regularly. A lot of times they're kind of straight. Um, but she also, we're gonna zoom in right here, right, right about here on the leg, because I think she has a tibial spine. Yes. You can see it amongst the hair. If we really, really zoom into this little itty bitty bee, we can see right about here, right about here, we have a tibial spine. Um, and this one is really cool because a lot of times the tibial spines are straight um, with just kind of one um, one point or two points, but this looks almost like a comb. It has this piece, this piece, and this piece. And <laughs> um, my guess, all right, I'm just going to hypothesize here because I'm not 100%, but my thought process would be check out where this spine is in comparison to in comparison to its body. I think that that's a cleaning spine. It looks like a little comb, and um, she's got so much hair on the abdomen that I think she's going to be using that spine to kind of help rub that leg against her abdomen and help clean herself off. Yeah, if there's an evolutionary reason for the spine. Um, that's my guess, is that that spine is used to clean off her abdomen. Um, there are a number of different insects that have tibial spines. Um, for instance, in cockroaches, uh, tibial spines are defensive. They've got lots of them, and they can kind of poke you with them. This, because of its, because of that really cool comb-like shape, I definitely think that it's for cleaning, which is really cool. All right, yeah, so I'm gonna sketch that. I'm gonna sketch that really fun little comb-like spine real quick. Um, and it's so small that on a sketch like this, your sketch has to be kind of huge for it to even kind of show up. But I'm just gonna put um, something like comb-like spine. And what's really cool is that that's something that I hadn't noticed about this elected before. So every time I come back to some of these specimens, it's like rediscovering them because you just keep learning new things about them. All right, now we've got a number of segments here. This tibial spine marks the end of the tibia. All right, then we're moving into the tarsi. Let's see. The question is, is that possibly pollen on and near the hairs? I would say that there's definitely a good chance that there is pollen on this bee. Yeah, um, a little bit here and here. Yeah, for sure. 
this is where they would also be collecting it because if they got pollen all over their abdomen, they would be able to use this comb to kind of comb it and hold onto it with their legs, right? And really right in like this area too, it looks like there is some cool. Yeah, and actually on my honeybee specimen, it still has a huge glob of pollen. So we'll be able to check that out. All right. Now, um, if... If this up here is the end of my tibia... And then we're starting our tarsi. This right here is going to be our first segment. It's like, uh, it's this long rectangle shape. And then it looks like in this area, we've got some smaller. Yeah, we've got some smaller segments. Let me get this focus right. Her legs just bent at a weird angle. Let me see. I'll sketch it out for you. All right, so we have that the, that that comb-like spine. We're moving in, and we've got um, the tarsal segment. That's kind of this boxy shape, and then we have two more segments that are getting smaller and smaller. Alrighty, and then this next one kind of increases in size a little bit and is roundy at the end. And it's going to have these two spy, these two little claws. And those little claws are called tarsal claws. And many, many, if not all insects, are going to have little tarsal claws. So those are something that we can see over and over again. Um, the number of tarsal segments is sometimes characteristic for families. Um, not with sweat bees. Alrighty. And looking at the, I wonder, so now the question, now the question is, does the middle leg also have a tibial spine or is it just on the hind leg? Let's get my dot out of the way. Here we go. Oh, cool. All right, really quick. Do you see this tarsal claw right here? The tarsal claw on these guys isn't just bifed. It looks like it's it's like there's four points on it. So there's, um, on my tarsal claw, I have two points on the left side and two points on the right side. That's cool. That's unique. I like seeing unique things on my insects. And then moving on up. All right, so we've got the femur. We have this tibia that's also a little roundy like the last one. It looks like we do not have a tibial spine this time, guys. So we might be right. We might know that that comb is used for the abdomen because my middle leg doesn't have it. And then we're going into this segment for the tarsi, these two little itty bitty pieces, and then our claw with four points. Let me get this sketched out. So that's gonna be our femur. And then we have our tarsi, or our, our tibia. And then tarsal segment number one, tarsal segment numbers two and three, and then the claw. Um, and this is such, and this is so small that I might even just make a little circle here and 
Honestly, I like this tarsal claw, so I'm going to blow it up a little bit. Sorry about the focus on this camera. I thought I had made it so that it had, it was going to stop autofocusing. It likes to try to focus on my hand rather than the sketch. Has it been disturbing anybody's sketches? The autofocus on my camera? I'm curious. Alright. I really wanted to get this bonus quad ped claw in. So, got it. Alrighty, and then we're going to move all the way up and we're going to do this front wing. Yay! Alright, good. Alright, now you can see that the my front pair of legs, they're both tucked up underneath my body. All right, thank you so much. Perfect. All right, so we are going to flip my bee over and we're gonna take a look at its first pair of legs to see. I'm gonna take the labels off. Make sure I remember to put the labels back on. Our bee may have lost a leg at some point. Yeah, poor guy. All right. All right, we got an angle that'll work. Good, good, good. All right, I'm happy that the that the focus isn't a problem. We're doing good. All right, so we've got that second and third pair of legs. Our first pair of legs is connected way up here. Um, so you can see there's this kind of vast, maybe I'm gonna, I wanna get this leg just up a little bit. I think I put it too close to the hind leg. All right. That feels a little better. And then um, we're coming up here for our for our la for our first pair of legs. <laughs> I almost said last because we're doing them backwards. Um, this right here is the femur and the tibia. This way back here, that's kind of like the hip bone. We call it the coxy. You can't see the coxy from the top. The most we would be able to see is the little bit of the end of the femur. And then um, the tibia moving forward. And then the little tarsi. So it looks like this segment right here is fairly long and I'm going to say that the first pair of legs is probably very similar to the second and the third where it's got um, one kind of square tarsal segment, two triangular ones, and then the claw. Coxy femur, or femur tibia, tarsi number one, triangle, triangle. My legs and antenna really like to hit each other. There we go. One. All right, so something like that. Yes. All of the legs have hip-like connections um, that allows definitely for this type of movement. Um, we can flip the bee over to look at some of those. Uh, 
Also, between the femur and the tibia, they have a little itty-bitty triangular segment called the trochanter, which is essentially a, like a kneecap. Um, but a lot of times the segment is so small that um, you have to really zoom in on it to find it. And sometimes it's even kind of like tucked a little bit. All right, so if we are, we're looking at the ventral side of my sweat bee, and you can see um, this is where the second pair of legs connects and then the third pair. Um, this right here that we were looking at, this is, yeah. Um, this right here is the femur. Um, and that's what we can start seeing from the dorsal view. But then here, this is what we call the coxa. C-O-X-A. Um, and if you want to pluralize that, you add an E to the end of it. So it's a coxa or coxy. Um, and those are going to be kind of like those hip bones or those um, hip segments. Kind of just want to really quick check out some of these. This is cool. Uh, am I going to remember the terms for them? Sclerites. So each of, so when you see a plate, a plate on an insect, those are sclerites. I just wanted to make sure. Yes. All right. So um, when, so all, I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent because this is something cool that I see on the bottom and I want to be able to talk about it. So right here, um, we have a number of different kind of plates on my exoskeleton. And you can see it looks almost... Sternites. Eric Eaton, thank you. That's the, I was looking for sternites and tergites, which is what I was getting to. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so each one of these individual segments on an insect's exoskeleton is a sclerite, right? So a sclerite is one individual, like, little plate. And then um, we have... Um, names for the segments, whether they are on the top of the body or on the bottom of the body. So if when we're looking at the bottom or the dorsal side of our abdomen, this plate right here in the middle is a sternite, right? So it's a, it's a sclerite that is on the bottom. Now, um, there are also tergites or um, these pieces that, uh, these sclerites that are on the top. Now, the sternites and the tergites in this specimen, they kind of wrap around. So you can see right here, this is that, um, that tergite that came down and around. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to practice my sternites versus tergites, uh, sketching, um, skills, but I'm happy that you were able to make it, Eric. Oh, man. Uh, you guys might even be able to do this better than I can right now here. Anyway, yeah, so we've got the sternites that are on the bottom and the tergites that are on the top, and these ones wrap around, and so you can kind of see how they match. Um, my sketch is a little poor. I'm going to have to fix that. But I got all excited and went all crazy like. Celebs are in the house. If anyone that doesn't know Eric Eaton, he's got, well, actually his book is over there on my shelf. So that's kind of exciting. All right. Um, now we've got, we've got our collected. Now I'm thinking we could sketch the ventral side of our insect, or, so we've got a couple of, we have a couple of different options. 
Um, I did bring... I brought other Hymenops. I brought a honeybee. I brought um, an invasive leaf cutter bee, the giant resin bee. Here, actually, I can show you this way. All right, so I brought um, I brought a honeybee. I brought a bald faced hornet. Um, this is a giant resin bee. It's actually an invasive leaf cutter bee, and. This guy, he's a uh, he's a blister beetle, so he's a Maloid. So he's not a bee, but beetles got the second number amount of votes for what we were going to do. And blister beetles have this really cool interaction with um with uh with bees. They have a they have a parasitic reaction. Yes. So, uh, interaction. <laughs> I know there are too many of them, um, but honestly, there are too many cool beetles, and there are too many cool flies, and there are, we could talk about hanging flies, the vitacids or whatever, they're, those guys are kind of crazy looking. Um, I do have uh, mantispids that we can get into and sketch. Um, I'm really excited to kind of dig in and see what we can draw. Um, so, my question to you is, do we want to continue on my collected and look at another, um, and maybe look at it head-on or look at it ventral side, or do we want to pick a new insect? Good. Um, I'm thinking we either pick... New bug! All right, let me get... So every now and again, I will put my insect back in the collection without putting the labels. Where did my labels go? Nope. I'm gonna have to find those. I think my insect labels fell off my tray. Oh well, we'll have to, we'll, we will get those back. Um, I did want to show you guys this because um, we had talked about pollen on the legs and my honeybee does still have pollen in its um, pollen baskets. And then I think we'll probably do the blister beetle because I want to talk about, about uh, their awesome triangulan larvae. New bug, haha, ha, too fast. Hmm, new bee, new bug bee, new, bu new bee. <laughs> I know, I want to make sure that I don't, every now and again when I take labels off of specimens, I'll forget to put them back on, and then, you know, you want to make sure that your collection not only has sketches from it, but stays um, scientifically valid, right? <laughs> Um, so, uh, my hind leg on my honeybee, you can see right here, this is going to be, um, this is going to be the hind leg, and it has lots of these long hairs, um, long hairs along it, and this is its, uh, this is its pollen basket, and right here, this is a whole bunch of pollen on my bee. So, I think that he is pretty cool like that. I guess. I think we can draw a honeybee. I really like looking at honeybees head on. So we're going to do that first, I think. Too much light. All right, I really like looking at honeybees from head on for a couple of different reasons. Um, reason number one, they actually have hair on their compound eyes. So right here on the edges of their head, you can see all of these, see here, all of these long fluffy hairs. If we zoomed in on the compound eyes, you can actually see, 
Yes. You can actually see the hair coming out from between those segments in the eyes. Um, also, uh, bees get, yeah. Um, and also bees don't just get a chewing mouth part. And they don't just get, like, a lapping mouth part. Honeybees get both a chewing and a lapping mouth part. So if we're looking at right about here, these are going to be our mandibles. You see they come down in this triangle and they have these edges right here. Doop, doop, doop. Right here, yeah. So those are going to be my bees' mandibles. They use it to chew anything that they're looking for um, every now and again, pollen, right? And then, <laughs> and then if we look down past, this little thing that kind of looks like a tongue is kind of used like a tongue. It's this lapping mouth part. So there's a bunch of different individual pieces to this, but it's essentially like a sheath that opens up and allows this little tongue down so that she can drink nectar or sugar water or whatever she wants to drink. I now appreciate not having hairy eyes. I love that. <clears throat> so I'm going to take a little bit of time and check out this head and sketch it. I'm starting on a new sheet of paper. We've got a new species. Um, this is what I had ended with my Helicted. <clears throat> and then moving forward, this is um, this is a honeybee. So obviously, um, its scientific name is Apis mellifera. All right, Apis mellifera. These are in the family. Um, I guess I can write honeybee just so that everyone knows what we're doing and where we're at. And um, these guys are in the family Apidae. Now, there are many, 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 um, there are many different, different types of bees in this family, right? Can we get a scale in comparison to the sweat bee? Yes, we can. So my honeybee looks like it's just a little bit larger than, or the honeybee looks like it's just a little bit larger than my sweat bee, the helicted. All right. Oh, don't, don't hurt it. Okay, let's get this head. So I'm right here. I'm starting with the um, I'm starting with the the right compound eye. It's just the one that called to me first, so it's where I started. you know honeybees are native to Europe, right? So they're not native to the United States. Um, there has been this issue with colony collapse disorder, right? So where our bees are 
um, either dying or they're leaving the hive and they're not coming back or um, they have this mite. Um, it's affected by a variety of things like pesticides. Um, there's a part of me that also wants to think that honeybees, when they're flying, or when they're flying, they're actually using, um, they're using landmarks around them. So they have the ability to kind of follow rows or um, to follow markings, trees and rocks and things that they see around them to help that kind of guide them through life, essentially. Well, um, honeybees get moved around the country to follow the agriculture. Um, so it's not only that one farmer will have a colony of honeybees in one place, but every now and again, those bees will be put onto a large semi-truck, driven all across the country, and put at a different farm. Um, so there's a part of me that wants to believe that there's also, um, that maybe the bees are starting to get confused. I don't know if that's possible, but all right. My bee has elbowed antenna, right? So when we're looking at the antenna, it's going to have, um, these antenna that have this very long first segment and individual, um, flagellum or antennal segments at the end. Um, and those guys, uh, these, let's see, these elbowed antenna are actually going to be really helpful if you're trying to decide if something is a fly or a bee. So if you're looking at a, at a flower and you're thinking that definitely could be a bee, or it could be some type of fly that's mimicking a bee. You can always look at the antenna. Um, a lot of bees are going to have these long elbowed antenna, and flies have um, a lot of times what we call a aristate antenna, where the antenna kind of looks like this odd sausage-like guy, and then it's got an individual hair called an arista that sometimes has looks like a little bit of a feather, and that's what a fly's antenna looks like. I wrote dip ant, dipter antenna. Um, all right, moving down, we've got our really awesome mandibles that I love. And as you see, this um, uh, has this almost triangular shape moving down. I wish it was a little bit more even, but that's fine. All right, and then we had our fun little tongue. Um, again, an evolutionary question. Why hair on the compound eyes? You know, <laughs> I wish I had an answer to that. Um, I will write it down and then I'm going to see if I can find an answer to it because it's something that I have also wondered before. It's like, why, um, <coughs> hey, anybody out there in the, any, anybody out there in the chat world? No. Does anyone know why honeybees have hair on their eyes other than them just being super fluffy and awesome? I mean, they are generally covered in long hairs so that they can, um, <laughs> questions without answers, yes. Um, generally, all of those hairs are for collecting pollen, and so that would be my guess. Um, keep in mind that this is actually some, it's like a, um, I want to say shaft. It's like a sheath. It's, this is like a sheath for the mouth parts on the inside. So you can see that there's this middle line right here. And um, I don't think we can zoom in any further, but it actually kind of opens up. And it's really, I think that there's a YouTube video out there that of, of um, a bee's mouth part really close up and they dissect it. Um, and you get to kind of check out the pieces, which is kind of cool. All right. So we've got head on. We've got hairs on the eyeballs. Um, there was a number of questions about the, um, the wing venation and whether or not, um, all bees have stigmas. Um, bloop, 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 Just more pollen. Yeah. That's the only, that's the only 
thing that's the only reason I can really think of is like why would they have more hair on their eyes well why not have more hair on your eyes if you want to be as hairy as possible all right so um, if we are looking at my oh the other thing that we can look at are the little um, it's 11 o'clock. What are these? We'll look at them in a minute, and I'm sure the name will come to me. All right, so when we're looking at the, um, the honeybee wing venation, we've got this long coastal cell again, and we have, um, three subcoastal cells. So honeybees are also going to have those three. Um, if we look between the front and the hind wing, I want to show you this. because I know that this specimen has a really good example of it. So some people don't realize, so if you were talking to the layperson, right, and you asked them, how many wings does a bee have? Some of them will say four, which is the correct answer, and a number of them will just say two right because when they're flying it looks like both of their wings are connected well um my um my um bees have these guys down here and they're little itty bitty hooks that help hold the hind hold the front wing to the hind wing and those are called hamuli all right, yeah, so I wanted, I, I just wanted to look that up really quick for us. Um, if we're looking at the wings, so this is just a very, very zoomed in picture of where the front wing is going to meet the hind wing. So we can put FW and HW, and right here in the center, there are these little itty bitty hooks, and they're kind of like Velcro, and some of them on our hind wing actually aren't all the way connected, um, but these guys right here, they actually have a name. Those are called hemuli, and there's all different types of, um, of wing adaptations, but that's one of, I think that's one of the cool ones, because you can, you can actively see it in the, um, in the description, or in the, in the image. All right, so I think what we can do is we'll start our dorsal. We've kind of jumped around my honeybee a little bit, um, but I figured... Oh, he's so beautiful. She. All right, so um, we have the ability to kind of start with the head and move back. I was just seeing how much of this we can That'll work. Um, you'll see this little fuzzy part right there, that's the pin, so we're not gonna worry about that. Um, alrighty, we've got our head, um, where the head actually connects to the thorax. Um, it actually has a, a little bit of, a little bit of a neck section before the thorax gets connected. Um, you can kind of see that here where there's the back of the head and then the beginning of the thorax. Um,
right, so we have um, a very square with kind of roundy edges for our thorax. And it is so setose. You can see there's the fluff all over. Um, the legs do kind of just tuck up under the body, so I'm actually not going to worry too much about them. Um, we still have those. Um, we still have those elbowed antenna. All right, and then oh, didn't give it enough time to focus. There we go. So it looks like on my honeybee, she has one, two, three, four, five, six, and then maybe a little itty bitty segment on the end. One two, three, four, five, six, I would say probably seven. She doesn't have much of a wasp waist. You can see there's not a lot of space in between her thorax and her abdomen. Um, but those segments, those sclerites, they do go inside of each other. Um, and it looks like there are Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then a little one. Maybe not go so small. Yeah. All right. And we might draw... I'm going to go in and shade these a little darker back here. Alrighty. Yes, it is so hard to identify insects while they are alive and flying around. I would say almost impossible unless you knew the genera or a list of species in the area. Um, even trying to identify a bumblebee to species when we've got five or six different, um, it's really difficult while it's flying around all over the place. I would definitely say um, with, with these guys, pictures, really, really helpful. Or if you're trying to observe a flower and identify things, um, setting up a camera so that you can watch them fly through. Um, oh my goodness, I actually, I'm going to show you something really funny really quick. Um, I believe I have it, right? Let's see. It would be in my bug badge class.
Sorry, guys. I got distracted. I, uh, I didn't realize I didn't have my audio set up for that class yet. Sorry about that. Um, but I was trying to show you the, uh, the bee that was getting ran into by the paper wasp. So we had a, I had a cute little bumblebee that I was trying to video. And, um, as I was videotaping it pollinating, a paper wasp came and actually flew into it and bumped it while I was recording. And you can see him try to kind of steady himself and he looks up like, what was that other guy doing? And it just made me laugh because, you know, you never know what you're going to catch on film if you're recording the buggies. Which species, Amy, were you looking for? What species of bumblebee? Were you looking for the rusty patch? So keep in mind that our front wing is connected up here to the first segment, and then our hind wing gets connected down to our se second segment. They do kind of follow this same angle. Yes. Okay, the rusty patch. Do you know how they're doing? I haven't really heard much about them recently. Coastal cells. And then the hamuli. And something like that. The veins don't come all the way to the end. Yep, yep. And if I wanted to, I could throw in I could throw in a hind leg, um, especially because we have this really cool image of the um, of the pollen baskets we could put in here. Yeah. So if we are. Sorry, reading reading the comment sections. Um, what are characteristic veins in the honeybee? You guys are testing my knowledge, and I love it. I do know I I, I know that this honeybee also has these three subcoastal cells, like our helicid does. Um, having all of these characteristics memorized. I'm going to work on that. <clears throat> um, I can't think of any other really characteristic on here. All right. So I want to get I want to get some of this hind leg kind of sketched out just a little bit. But maybe I'm going to just, maybe I'm going to do it in a side box because the angle is going to be a little different. So um, I'm going to take it from the back, I think. Because I want to show. So 
So the tibia is almost like triangular shaped. It's kind of wider at the bottom than it is at the top. And um, this is where the pollen basket is. And that is all of these long hairs. We call that the pollen basket because it's where all of the pollen sticks. And you can end up with this huge glob of pollen like we have on this specimen right here. So this right here and that right there, both of those are just huge globs of pollen. Um, and uh, you can actually take the, um, the old pollen as long as, um, you can take the pollen off of the legs and run genetics on it and see what type of flowers this honeybee was pollinating, which is kind of cool. So we have Apis mellifera, our honeybee. All right, we have been going at this for about an hour and a half now. I am really, really proud of us. Um, we got through two ins, um, two different insects. <clears throat> Does it have sticky tibia or tarsus or tarsi? Um, no, it's not really sticky. Um, it's not really sticky. It's just those hairs. Um, they say that the hairs stick, but they're not, they don't release any sticky substance. They just, um, let's see, the hairs might be the hairs might be barbed of sorts. Let's look. go. So um, they're not sticky, but that nectar, right? Nectar is essentially sugar water. And so um, when the sugar water and like the nectar and the pollen, that's what kind of keeps it all packed nice and neat and together. Thank you, Eric. Um, so it looks like they're not sticky and they do not have little um, it doesn't even look like they have any barbs or anything on these hairs. They are just together and collecting little bits and um, little bits of pollen. Loving the questions, guys. Thank you for staying so interactive and hanging out with me. Um, now, I am actually feeling pretty good, so I do have the ability to... Um, is it in a sack? No. Um, the, this, um, this pollen isn't in any type of sack. It is just, um, it's just hard packed together. <laughs> pollen pants. I've never heard that before. I like it. I like giving insect body parts, you know, a little bit more common names, you know, a little bit more relaxed names. Um, if we're talking about some beetles, actually, we'll probably look at some um, beetle mouth parts uh, at some point, if not in this class. Um, and they have labial palps, and I like to call them mouth fingers. It's not the scientific name for them, but it gives you the idea of what they are. Right, and then our, um, leaf cutter bees, um, those, and then those brushes of hairs that collect the quote-unquote dry pollen, those, um, 
are called scopa. So if we look, this is a uh, this is a giant resin bee. It's a megachylid, so it's um, called a leaf cutter bee. And you can tell that these when these ones are when these are ladies because they have really really thick hairs on the bottom side of their abdomen. So this is the bottom side of a leaf cutter bee. And she hadn't collected much pollen when I when I collected her, but you can see all of these very long hairs. And I know she's not native, but she is a solitary bee, right? Mega eyelids, they don't make um they don't make huge nests. They take care of individual young. These guys, um, they benefit from bee hotels, if you've ever made a bee hotel and put that in your backyard. Um, and these long hairs on the bottom side of the abdomen together will help them collect lots and lots of pollen. And they're a little more difficult to see on the darker side of its abdomen, but they are here too. And when these bees are flying around and actively pollinating, the entire bottom side of their abdomen can be completely yellow and be completely full of pollen. Um, so that is one kind of cool characteristic of these guys. And that um, patch of long hairs is called a scopa. And instead of me writing it, I put it in the chat box so that you guys can use that if you'd like. Now, um, we're going to do a, a, a little story time before we get off because I want to tell you a little bit about how blister beetles interact with some bees. Now, um, I will preemptively say this, that, um, all right, this blister beetle right here is Epicauta vitata. It's the striped blister beetle. Um, collected it in, looks like Kentucky. All right. Um, but if we look at, so, so we've got, so we've got this one blister beetle. Now blister beetles are cool for a couple of reasons, but they have, they undergo something that we call hypermetamorphosis. So... Um, they start off as a little itty bitty egg, and then once the egg hatches, instead of going into like a grub shaped larva, they go into this larva that's mobile. And it has long antenna and walking legs and these two little cute little tails. And this is what's called a triungulin larva. And this guy, he's really, really good at walking around and staying very mobile. And it's only the first instar, the very, very first life stage. Now, these triungulin grubs will climb in groups to the top of a flower. And they will actually release the pheromones of uh, a female, of certain species of female bees um, looking to mate, right? So these guys are, are hanging out, they're hanging out on top of a flower. And they're saying, hey, hey boy bees, I smell like a lady, right? And you should come down and mate with me. And so if um, a male, um, if a male bee comes down and lands on this flower to pollinate or looking to mate, these triangulin larvae will actually crawl onto the bee. And because the bees have so much fluff and so much hair, they can easily hold on. And there are images out there of these triangulin larvae in the um, in the hundreds, right? Lots and lots of them because they are incredibly, incredibly small. Very, very, very small. Um, so you can have lots and lots of them on a single male bee. And then that male, he'll go and he'll try, he'll go and mate with a queen. Um, 
or another he'll he'll mate with the lady and then the triangulin will during the mating process go from the males to the females and then they will follow the females all the way back to their homes and so we have this triangulin larva that once it gets back to the home, it is eating baby bees. It's going to be eating the bees' eggs. It's going to be eating the bee grubs. And it'll feed on any of the food that was there for the babies, um, whether that's honey or um, other substances. The crazy thing is that once it makes it, once it makes it to a colony, to a, to a home, that it can live with, this grub turns into, we call it a C-shaped grub, but he just kind of turns into this like large grubby mass. He no longer has active legs, he doesn't go very far, um, and then he turns into his pupa, and he actually is going to pupate inside of one of the combs. Don't mind my sketchies. All right, and so it turns into a pupa. And then, after time, it'll go ahead and turn into my blister beetle. You know. Yeah, so that's a little bit about these guys' life cycle and how they relate and how they relate to bees, okay? Um, something that I love about this crazy life cycle is it's called hypermetamorphosis. Because instead, instead of just being egg, larvae, pupae, adult, they actually have five. They go from, they have two different forms of immature stages. And that's why we call that hypermetamorphosis. Yep, yep, yep. Now, um, there is a couple of things to say about this life cycle. All blister beetles do this, right? All blister beetles have a triangulin, they find some sort of bee or wasp, but depending on where they are in the country and what species they are, some are species specific, so they're only putting out the pheromones for one female and they're looking for that species to feed on. Um, some, uh, some others, they'll just kind of hang out on the top of flowers and wait and they're not as species specific. So it just depends on where in the country you are and what the, what are your blister beetles are trying to eat or who your blister beetles are trying to eat. All right. Um, I am thinking we are closing in on the end. Um, how is everybody feeling? I love that. I am, I am feeling a little tired, which is why I moved over into markering, but um, we can chat about bugs if we have lots of people that are still hanging out. Oh, grasshopper eggs, too. Do they have, um, do they have the same, I wonder if they have the same triangulin larvae that, um, do they... Eric Eaton, do you know if the triangulin larvae for the grasshoppers, if they ride on the grasshoppers, or if they just, like, search for, search for holes? Oh, I am so glad that you've enjoyed this, Eric. I would love it if you came back. You were also very helpful for us, you know, um, coming in and, and putting in the little, the little factoids as we went. Um, I'm having a lot of fun doing this. So we'll definitely keep going um, every week at Thursdays. I hope that you guys also enjoyed this. Um, I really enjoy having everybody interacting in the, in the comments. And I know that we all have things to learn about bugs, right? Yeah. I have to go check on other Blister Beetle Life Cycles. Oh no, <laughs> I love that. Let's not try and 
confuse all of the third graders. Um, we can... <laughs> Perfect. All right. So everyone is feeling pretty content. I'm feeling pretty happy. I think we got um, through a lot of what we wanted to. I hope that my face is not frozen like that. Um, my face is frozen on my screen. Oh, no. All right. Thank you so much. If you and if you enjoyed this, go ahead and subscribe to my channel just so that you can get um, updates when I post more. Um, when I post new videos, um, if you really, uh, if you super, super enjoyed this, come back next week. And I also teach out school classes. So I teach classes for students, um, six to nine and nine to 12. Sorry, my camera just went out. It's saying it's time. All right, so I teach classes for students um, 9 to 12, 13 to 17. So if you know somebody who would love to illustrate a little bit with me or study an insect every week, um, this week we're doing ladybugs, so that's been a lot of fun. Um, go ahead and get them hooked up with me. Uh, thank you so much for hanging out, and I look forward to seeing you everybody next week. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. <laughs>